Hi everyone, my name is Elena Martinez and I'm one of the artistic directors of the Bronx Music Heritage Center. And we're going to meet um, our other artistic director very soon, but welcome to our November Music by the Book program. First, before we begin, I just want to give a shout out to our funders. The Bronx Music Heritage Center programming is supported in part by the National Endowment for the Arts, the New York State Council on the Arts with the support of the New York State Legislature, public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council, the Lily Auchincloss Foundation, the Laurie M. Tisch Illumination Fund, and the Howard Gilman Foundation. And as I said, we want to thank you for coming to our program today. This is, um, we're celebrating Music by the Book for Puerto Rican Heritage Month. So today's, tonight's program will look at the um, book, West Side Story as Cinema, The Making and Impact of an American Masterpiece, and talk to the author of that book, Ernesto Acevedo Munoz. And just to give a little background on Ernesto, Ernesto Acevedo Munoz is a professor of cinema studies and the chair of the Department of Cinema Studies and Moving Image Arts at the University of Colorado Boulder. He is the author of, of books, including the West Side Story, a cinema book, um, Pedro Almodovar, and Buñuel in Mexico, The Crisis of National Cinema. He is also, um, he <coughs> teaches um, on all sorts of film history and theory, Hollywood genres, um, Spanish and Latin American cinemas, and on directors, including Alfred Hitchcock and Stanley Kubrick. I noticed that was another connection we have. Another, we'll have to have you back for the Bronx connection to the Stanley, the Stanley yeah. Kubrick talk at some point um, sure. for that. So we want to welcome you to, um, to the Bronx Music Heritage Center's online programming. And um, so to, just to um, give a little bit of background about um, this program. Oh, first, anyone watching on Facebook? Please, um, if you have any comments or questions, basically questions for Ernesto, please put them in the Facebook comments section and we will make sure we, at, as part of the show, we will get to the questions and, and answer your questions live um, here tonight. So we wanted to, um, want to, to put this, um, in, you know, to put the context of this program tonight. Ernesto's books came out in 2013. But we want to discuss it tonight because, of course, every, we're all in anticipation of the release of the Steven Spielberg adaptation of West Side Story, which is coming out in a few weeks. Everyone's probably heard about it. If, if you love it or you hate it, it's already creating a buzz. Um, there's been all articles written about it already, but, um, you know, both sides, positive, neg negative. So I'm um, critiquing either what's, what may come out or what's been, how it's been for the production or as well as the original film. So um, we're here to talk about that, but we also have a, another invested interest in, in the West Side Story, um, story and the film, because as you know, our other artistic director, Bobby Sanabria, he, um, you know, um, his last CD was all about West Side Story. Um, so just to go back in 2018, um, the West Side Story Reimagined by Bobby Sanabria was um, released, West Side Story Reimagined. It was his take on the music of Leonard Bernstein 60 years later after the film. It was nominated for two Grammys, I think, two Grammy um, awards. Um, and at that time, right around that time, um, uh, there was an article by the Puerto Rican Legal Defense Fund listserv that was run by Angelo Falcone came out about saying that, oh, Steven Spielberg's in the process of making West Side Story. So I was like, oh no. I was like, He's gonna take. He's gonna take the the all the you know wind away from Bobby doing this new album. So I, I called Angelo and I was like, "Let Bo can Bobby write about or send you something about what his vision of this is?" So um, Angelo was like, "Sure, get us something." And Angelo Falcone, may he rest in peace, was so great. Bobby wrote something. He put it on that list. Of, and probably a lot of you have probably read about you know Bobby's take and his perspective on the music and, and the film, and um and his his vision of that. So um so that being said. Um, you know, the play, the movie, the lyrics, the music of West Side Story are, you know, are, have, have been incredibly lauded, but have also been very contentious over the past 60 years. I admit, I know when I was um, in grad school reading all the scholarly articles about it, um, I, you know, that were like against, you know, another gang film with Puerto Ricans, I was like, oh yeah, that's horrible. Puerto Ricans are showing us like gang members again. Um, you know, you know, we shouldn't, you know, support something like this. But then, you know, and but there's, that's understandable too, right? We, we, that era when West Side Story came out, there were all these. There was a whole, you know, line of of movies that showed Puerto Ricans and other Latinos and African Americans mm -hmm. as gang members. So it sort of came out in in that context. It was you know right. not really good because that was the only way people were seeing Puerto Ricans anyway at, at in that era, um, at a time of like high migration from the island. So, <clears throat> but that being said, um, you know, a few years later, I remember watching it. 
I mean, not a few years, but a few years ago, I, I watched it again. And then I was really knocked out by how powerful it was. It's so powerful. I mean, you cry about, you know, you watch it and you cry. There's, you know, it's, it's, there's, tr there's a real tragedy in it. And, and there's powerful scenes like when An Anita, the Rita Moreno char character is, is, a, you know, assaulted and, and, and how she defends herself. She's not just a victim, how she defends herself and goes back to, to the people who do that to her. So I think, um, I was, I was, I was like, oh no, this is, this isn't, my original reaction was a knee-jerk reaction. And I wonder if a, a lot of reactions are these like knee-jerk reactions to it without <clears throat> thinking about it further. So um, now I know it's, it, it can be problematic, some of the representation, but I'm, I'm also on the fence about that because, you know, my father was a gang member and that was his experience in New York City. And so why should like academics writing articles silence my father's experience of, of, of growing up in New York City? So all these things sort of come into play when we think about, um, about West Side Story. So that being said, through a, another set of circumstances, Bobby and I have been, were able to meet Ernesto, who is with us here tonight. And before we bring Ernesto on and start talking to him, I wanna introduce Bobby Sanabria, the other artistic director, and, um, and let him say a few words about tonight's program for, for him. Thank you so much, Elena. It's a pleasure to be here. Un placer, como siempre, estar aquí con todo el mundo que están uh, mirándolos aquí mundialmente. Thank you to everyone for tuning in to The Place to Be, the BMHC, the Bronx Music Heritage Center. Well, uh, I don't want to take uh, too much time away from Dr. Munoz, who has so much to share with us. But West Side Story uh, greatly affected me when I was young. It was the first time I had seen Puerto Ricanos depicted on the screen and in a position of strength and power fighting the so-called powers that be. We'll get into that with Dr. Munoz and everything else that uh, you always wanted to know about what West Side Story, but were afraid to ask. But first, let me welcome Dr. Munoz to Music by the Book. Welcome, Dr. Munoz. Bienvenidos. Um, gracias, Bobby. Gracias, uh, Elena. Um, un placer ser parte de esta serie. I look forward to uh, coming down one day personally to the Bronx Music Heritage Center and uh, listen, maybe listen to some music next time I'm in New York. Most definitely, most definitely. Uh, I, I wanted to get some of the uh, preliminary things out of the way first. When did you first uh, see West Side Story? Did you see the musical first on a stage in a stage production or did you see the film first? And how did both affect you? Well, um, I was, when when we were kids, I mean, I was born in 1968. Uh, West Side Story had already had its um, original theatrical and uh, movie runs way before I was born. But we were, in my family, we were among the first people in town. I, we're from the town of Aguada, Puerto Rico, where I was born in went to school and grew up until I went off to college at, at the UPR. Uh, we were one of the few families to own a home video tape player. We had a, a, an old uh, Zenith uh, Betamax um, <laughs> video player with, because that was, uh, but that was new. I'm talking 79 or 80, which is like pretty new. And uh, there were, essentially there were a handful of movies that were uh, that were available. I can say that uh, before I ever saw uh, the West Side Story movie, uh, it was one of the few albums of, shall I say, popular music that uh, we had around the house. Uh, and I mean, the album from the movie was the one we had, uh, not not from the, the stage show of 57, but the 1951 movie. Uh, you know, there was music in my house all the time, but it was usually classical music. My father was a classical music person. We learned to listen to opera and to, you know, Tchaikovsky's 1812 Overture and Ravel's Bolero before we ever heard a, a salsa album in my house ever. But, mm -hmm. uh, but we did have the West Side Story album from the movie and it became part of the household soundtrack, you know, to play once in a while. We learned to sort of phonetically you know, sing the the song lyrics, uh, and this was been this would have been a few years. Then after uh, we mm, had the opportunity of owning a, a a Betamax home video player that you just hooked up to your TV, we had a handful of movies 
that we acquired in those first couple of years. You know, we had we had Grease and Superman, and uh, those movies helped my brother and I learn English. Uh, mm. Just watching those movies without subtitles, and then as pretty much I would venture as soon as it became available. Uh, we acquired a, a Betamax tape of, of West Side Story. It came in two tapes. Uh, you know, it was a, a big box because it came in two, two tapes, a pan and scan, old fashioned pan and scan version of the movie. And that would have been, I want to say, you know, 81 or 82, uh, the first time that we saw the movie on a television screen. Uh, and then it became sort of part of our rotation of movies that we bring in the kids from the neighborhood because nobody else has nobody else had a, a a movie tape player kids from the neighborhood would come to my house to watch you know the three or four movies that we had and one of them was West Side Story and of course the 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 shock in in the good sense of the word uh just of hearing the words Puerto Rico spoken in a movie was um incredible to us it was a, a, an enormous shock in in the good sense of the word like wow this movie is about Puerto Ricans. And, you know, most, they don't look Puerto Rican, but what the hell, you know, um, that we didn't have a problem with that. And then eventually uh, the movie would have become kind of a, an important part of our, of our movie watching experience. And uh, many, many, I mean, I, I never saw West Side Story on stage uh, until I was at the University of Colorado. I mean, this would have been, um, I think the first time I saw West Side Story on stage, I saw, uh, Central City Opera production um, that would have been, I want to say, 2008. After that, I've seen many stage uh, productions, including the 2009 revival that uh, you know about that uh, Karen Olivo won, won a, a, a Tony Award and Lin-Manuel Miranda helped to translate uh, some, some, some lyrics into, into Spanish, which ended up not working out, but I, I was excited the first time I saw that revival in 2009 and hearing Karen Olivo sing, uh, Ese cabrón mató a tu hermano. Like, wow, yeah, this, that's exactly what she's saying. She's not using those words, but, you know, pardon my French, but that's, uh, right. you know, that's what she's saying. And, but the point is that from the movie in the early 80s to my, you know, my education at the University of Puerto Rico and the University of Iowa, West Side Story was always a part of my life. So, and then eventually, eventually I had the luxury of doing what I did and we'll talk about the book when we get there. But, uh, but that was a luxury that I was able to afford uh, many, many years later. I'm very curious from, uh, uh, at the time when you first saw the movie in Puerto Rico, was the, yourself and the general population of Puerto Rico, were they aware of the importance of Rita Moreno? Mm, I would say only people who would have been mm, already movie or theater people, and you know, theater people, theater audiences are always smaller than than movie audiences. But right. you know, um, home video systems were extremely rare uh, at that time, and so no, I mean, I still to this day I know a lot of people. Uh, even among my, you know, my cousins and my and my relatives who never seen uh, West Side Story. Now Rita Moreno became an institution on her own, right? Outside of her, the 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 impact and the splash that she made uh, with, with with West Side Story. But given that she made most of her career in English, and the reality is, to this day, Bobby Elena, you may know. Uh, you know, Eng English is still kind of a rare language in Puerto Rico. She was in, she was in the electric company. We didn't have the electric company. We had um, the Muppet Show and we had uh, the Mexican version of Sesame Street, Plaza Sesamo, right? Rita Moreno wasn't there, right? right? I know for a fact myself, I saw Rita Moreno in West Side Story in the low 80s and then some time in television, I, I know also when we were kids, this would have been early, also early, mid 80s, uh, we saw a movie called Poppy uh, uh, with Alan Arkin, who right. played, uh, plays a, a Puerto Rican guy who tries to be Cuban, <laughs> who, who pretend that, that his children right. are, are Cuban refugees coming in right. 
in a, in a raft and he takes him to Miami and his girlfriend in the building was Rita Moreno. And I think, you know, that was one of those points where my father would have pointed, hey, that's the great Puerto Rican actress Rita Moreno in, uh, in, in Poppy. And yeah, Poppy is a movie that we, that we remember uh, seeing and sort of, of paying attention to, to Rita Moreno in that, uh, in that context. I'm fascinated by that because that would mean that somebody like uh, another great Puerto Rican actor uh, Jose Ferrer would not yeah. be that known on the island as well. You know, and we, yeah, we knew, we were aware of Jose Ferrer and my, 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 our father was a, a drama teacher in school. Oh, I so, see, I see. so he knew we had the edge of having somebody in the house who was aware of, of the arts and music and theater and movies. And it was my father who introduced us to the movies and, and, and took, he would take us out of, out of school on a Friday afternoon to drive us to a movie, uh, so that we could go to the to the opening night of Close Encounters of the Third Kind, for example. You know, mm -hmm. it would have been 1977, right? Uh, so my father was aware and very much proud as a as a nationalist and uh, and uh, an independentista uh, of of anything that that Puerto Ricans earned. Uh, recognition for so yeah the name of Jose Ferrer was familiar to us as was eventually later the name of 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 Rita Moreno and then you know after them there are so many others my father knew Miriam Colon uh, when mm. when he was in New York in the 1950s I think you know or, or maybe 60s he knew he knew Miriam Colon he knew uh, oh my God what's her name Iraida Polanco. Uh, who was also part of the of the New York theater theater scene? So he right. he knew these people, um, and as a as a uh, a drama teacher, he had some connections with the with the theater uh, with the theater world, uh, and uh, luckily, so we knew who those people were. I know Irina Polanco went to my house one time. I don't I don't remember the context, uh, but I know she was there uh, one time. You know. Um, and yes, of course, Rita Moreno and Jose Ferrer, later on when I was at the University of Puerto Rico, his Oscar was on, on display at the University of, Theater, uh, the University of Puerto Rico Theater uh, until it was stolen one day and then it disappeared and nobody's ever seen it again. Oh. So, <laughs> Ernesto, I want to ask you a couple of questions about just the aesthetics of the film before we go into, you know, talk about representation and some other things. Um, you, you, in your book, you have um, this um, quote. You say, West Side Story has more political bite than any other musical film of its time. We'll get to that. And offers a near perfect example of a complex and visible relationship between form and content. Because in the book, in the first few chapters, you really do a deep dive. And I mean, I, mean, I, knew, I, I knew a little bit. I knew like, you know, color schemes were there, but you really do a deep dive in the use of the color and palette and lighting. In really, in really telling the story, and really being, um, you know, the basis of the story. Um, I, can, I don't know if I could just throw a general question out there, but can you talk a little bit about that to people? So really, when they're watching a film, to really look how how that makes a difference and how that yeah. sets the story and sets the mood. Sure, and I'll, and I'll tell you, um, I would not. Have, all the Puerto Ricans in the world would not have made me want to do this thing. I did this thing as I have to take off my my Puerto Rican hat and put on my film historian hat and look at the movie for its own aesthetic value. A, a movie to be paid at, a movie has to be interesting visually, just like, you know, um, a music show has to be interesting musically. All the flashing lights and all the smoke effects in the world is not going to make music interesting uh, or somebody sing who can't sing, uh, you know. But so I was interested in the movie I was introduced to the movie as a Puerto Rican. I become, I became interested in the movie as a subject of study, as a film historian, in terms of its, it, what is the, the contribution of this movie to the history of the genre? And the musical genre has always been very colorful and there's a lot of play of certain kinds, but the, the design of West Side Story was really uh, integral. You know, it was something really uh, holistic where, uh, and some of that had seen a little bit of its uh, of its origins in in the original stage production, right? I mean, the the producer uh, the producer and director Robert Weiss he he hired 
uh, Irene Sharaf to do the costumes, right? She'd done the costumes on, on Broadway, though she, she reinvented her own creation uh, for the movie. But then, you know, she comes in with her own visual sense of what costuming can do. And then in comes the, 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 the director uh, of photography. And, uh, and this, I, I also talk a lot about the, the photographic visual effects in the movie, which were really groundbreaking. In fact, uh, Linwood Dunn, the guy who did the photographic visual effects for, uh, for West Side Story was the first person to establish an independent company that all they did was photographic visual effects. That was all they did. Uh, and so on one hand, you get- It's a parallel universe to that with later on industrial light and magic, you know, in the modern yeah. context. Yeah. And, and so you go through a certain design that establishes certain color patterns for the jets and certain color patterns for the sharks. And those color patterns tend to also be seen in the backgrounds, not just the costumes they're wearing, they can wear, they can work out a little bit in terms of, of how light uh, works, uh, and it helps create this uh, this kind of a very vibrant and at the same time kind of kind of violent visual scape uh, of which and and we see the first uh, the first uh, example of that we see in the the sort of abstract New York City skyline that that opened the movie uh, that opens the movie designed by by Soul Bass where we have certain musical motifs from the score and that that overture was written by Lenny Bernstein for the movie right it doesn't it doesn't exist in the show he wrote that overture for the movie and you see how the the visual design sort of shifts colors and hues uh, as the as as the musical motifs are heard and then those musical motifs become associated with certain colors which are later sort of revisited in the the dance of the gym sequence in particular where, where color is that's really where color explodes in ways uh that uh, that we hadn't seen that we hadn't seen before uh even uh, or if you recall maria and tony in in the bedroom you know as they set up for uh for the love making scene and somewhere and there's those there's that that door with the sort of um, gels on the on the glass and the light is coming in and they're they're broken into like four different shades of blue and red and yellow and and so that impact i mean color is a representation of of emotion right uh and 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 the movie which has a capacity to do this i mean you know there are some things you can do in movies that you can't do in theater and vice versa right but uh the way that light and color and a lot of these very um, uh, really groundbreaking I'm not going to say at the time because that's that's ageist you know these were groundbreaking um, photographic effects period right I don't have to say they were pretty good for the time no they were good period uh, and but a lot of that work was really um, really pioneering the only place you could see work like that in terms of color, and certain color motifs would have been an experimental cinema. An experimental cinema still belonged only in very small venues and museums and, you know, um, those, those kinds of things. So then, and that also um, brings up the, uh, I mean, even the color was thinking of, you know, everyone, everyone it was easier to recognize the color of the clothes, right? They wear in that, but you were picking out like when, um, you know, I didn't ever notice, and I guess I guess it's supposed to be in the movies. It's supposed to be subconscious, I guess. Like when when Tony and Maria are starting to sort of like merge in yeah. their romance, their colors change, right? They sort of start moving away from their jets colors or their sharks colors and becoming a different color. So I mean, all that I guess is that supposed to be sort of subconscious, right? I mean, most people aren't not supposed to really be thinking about this, other than like you you think about it because that's who you are. But we're really yeah, it's, it's, very, it's very deliberate, right? That that Maria and Tony, uh, little by little, they start to wear each other's colors, right? That is, uh, and and again, the the pattern I I show it in, in my book, right? The pattern is like pretty clear of how color shifts uh, from one thing to the other. But for instance, we know that certain like yellows and mustard and ochre are really jets colors, and that. 
purples and reds and greens are really like sharks colors. Uh, and then eventually, particularly, I, I point to the, the, the mock wedding uh, in, uh, in um, um, Madame Lucia's um, uh, bridal shop where we actually see that Tony's wearing um, shark's colors. The, the, the lining of his jacket is, is purple and Maria is wearing the yellow and, and orange sort of like sewing frock. And, and that is, I mean, that is, that's the last time they're happy together, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and they get to have that. Something that is, it's a visual motif that it's, it's very clearly very deliberate in terms of production design and costume design. Uh, but it doesn't hurt the movie if the average moviegoer doesn't see it. Uh, it's okay. We don't need to see it. We know what's happening between Tony and Maria. But if you can see it, that's when you start to say, ah, well, look, here's, here's a, a sign, of, a visual sign of, of that turn, of that, uh, of, of that merging, right? Uh, of that, as in, we call it in, in theory of the, of the Hollywood musical, that personality dissolve, where they're, they're starting to become sort of, you know, part of one another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and another thing you talk about um, in, in, um, in, in the book is also the placement of the songs. Um, and so maybe Bobby, you put, you have an interest in this as well, because you, um, you know, studied the music and in terms of how it was, and, and there's a reason, there's a reason why the songs were placed in a certain order and why that was changed um, from the theater to film. If maybe you can both talk about that, like your perspective on that a little bit. Right. And my perspective, I, 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 in, in West Side Story, we imagine we stuck to the original order of the songs as they appeared in the stage musical. They were changed in the, in the movie, uh, yeah. as well as other things, dialogue, et cetera, that Maestro Ernesto can address to, so much to the point that Arthur Lawrence and correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Munoz, he saw the movie once and he said, I never want to see this ever again. You know, Who like, said that? Oh, supposedly, I would, Arthur Lawrence said oh, that. Oh, Arthur Lawrence said that. Yeah, I believe it. Yeah, he said, I, I never want to see this piece of, you know, what, ever again. Yeah. So uh, offended by the fact that his dialogue, much of his dialogue was changed and the order of the songs, et cetera. Yeah, mm -hmm. but, but it made sense. I mean, I, and I... I, tr I tried to address this from, from the perspective of narrative structure when it comes to what theater can do and what movies can do. Uh, theater has its own, its own rules. Um, you know, you ever been to uh, a Broadway show, you know that the, the, the second act is shorter and darker in most shows. Uh, you know that certain music motifs are revisited in the second act, right? Um, and but but a movie is structured technically, you know, what we refer to as the, the three act structure, where you get uh, a, a, a first act of exposition and uh, sort of you, you set up the action, and then you go to see the conflict in act two, and then you go to the resolution of that conflict, or not, as in the case of West Side Story and any number of other cases. Um, the, the major decision of changing particularly the order of Officer Kropke and Cool, and also moving uh, forward the placement of I Feel Pretty uh, had to do with sustaining a certain sense of, uh, of mood uh, in the movie, right? And uh, of course, Frankly, the, the 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 swapping. I mean, essentially, Cool and Officer Krupke were just swapped. They just were put in in the respective place of the other song uh, in in the movie. Um, and and I feel pretty was moved up to before the rumble, right? As opposed to where it exists in the original theatrical version, which is the opening of the second act after the rumble. And so the screenwriter, uh, Ernest Lehman, uh, who had um, you know, made his bones way before in Hollywood, most famously, he wrote um, Alfred Hitchcock's um, North by Northwest, right? Which, which also has a connection to West Side Story. We can talk about another connection. We can talk about that uh, later because I mentioned it. 
I mentioned it in the book, but the editors made me put it as a as a footnote, and I don't think it should have been a footnote. But anyway, <laughs> he's looking at this thing and saying, no, wait a minute. After the rumble, the mood has to stay dark. The mood has to stay somber. And so mm, moving, that that was the decision of moving, moving cool to after the rumble and Officer Krupke before the rumble, right? So that the, the, the mood remains mostly light and ebullient until after the rumble and then everything goes to hell. Mm, say, I feel pretty after the rumble would be a kind of bus killer in a movie. I'm not saying it doesn't work fine in the theater, but, but movie narrative has its own rules. And uh, those kinds of, of, um, of mood swings in a movie are less uh, acceptable to, to movie going audiences. Now, why that is, is technically relevant, right? But theater audiences tend to be a little more uh, sophisticated, theory, generally more educated, right? So uh, they may be exposed to more things. And by that, you know, we mean, yes, movies are art, but movies are also a popular art. And, and theater by definition is um, restricted to, well, those of us can pay for it. Uh, and those of us, you know, like to go to a professional Broadway show, right? So the mood thing was uh, really a turning point in maintaining that somber tone uh, that the movie takes uh, after the rumble and which to movie audiences, at least in the hands of the, uh, of the producers and the screenwriter, uh, of the 1961 movie uh, would have been unacceptable to general audiences. Like, it's already way a bus kill uh, <laughs> that everybody dies at the end. Uh, you know, let alone uh, to have this cheery, silly song like Officer Kropke minutes before that, right. because it literally is minutes before that, right? In in the case of of Officer Kropke, and uh, and I feel pretty as well, right? It's a, it's an, it's, it really is an intense thing. I mean, it's one of the reasons Cheryl Crawford was, correct me if I'm wrong, she was the producer at the time on Broadway, one of the, yeah. if not the producer, one of the major producers. She mm -hmm. basically told the team of Lawrence Sondheim, uh, Bernstein and Robbins, listen, you got three murders, an attempted rape. I mean, it's not a family friendly show. I don't think it's going to happen, you know, and, and right. she, put everything in a box and told them, I'm sorry, I can't do it. Right, and, uh, and look, luckily, uh, West Side Story, the movie West Side Story, you know, I think it was one of the, um, one of the Myers brothers saw, saw the show on Broadway in 1958. And, you know, that first run was like 57 to 59. Um, one of the Myers brothers saw the movie and he, he wanted to acquire it for, uh, to be produced as a movie by, um, uh, the Myrish company right now. Why this is important in terms of the history of West Side Story, the movie, is that it comes way just at the turn, the end of the classical, of what we know as the era of classical Hollywood. And, and it was acquired, the, the property, as it is called, it was acquired by uh, the, brothers, uh, the, the brothers Walter and Harold Myrish were independent producers. Now, independent producers were a really new thing in Hollywood in the 1950s. And the Myers brothers were among the, the mavericks. I mean, they really were. The people who essentially came up with the idea, wait a minute, why do I have to work for the movie studios and always crank out exactly the same product if we can produce these movies on our own and then independently, they didn't use that word then. Now we call them indies, right? We, don't, we can produce these movies independently and then sell them to the studios for distribution. But, and, and the reason I say this is important, if the Myrish brothers, among the mavericks of independent film producers in Hollywood working in the 1950s, specifically in the late 1950s, if they had not acquired West Side Story, it could have been acquired, say, by uh, 20th Century Fox, uh, who produced through the 50s and 60s all the big 
uh, Rogers and Hammerstein's movies, right? Going back to uh, Oklahoma and The King and I, right? And these are all these Rogers and Hammerstein's uh, um, properties. If Fox, which <laughs> produced The Sound of Music a few years later, also directed by Robert Weiss, if Fox had acquired West Side Story, we'd have a happy ending. You know, mm-hmm. we would have said, well, sure, we can make this into a great movie, but, you know, we need a happy ending. We need Tony and Maria somehow uh, to live happily ever after. And somehow we need to, and I, I'm not saying that I know that as a fact, but for what I know about the history of Hollywood and West Side Story being also uh, groundbreaking in the fact that there is no resolution, that music does not, music and dancing does not solve our conflicts as they do in all the other movies. Uh, right. We could have had a very, very different movie, uh, but luckily it just happens to be, you know, in the linear history of Hollywood that the studios are coming apart, independent producers are on the rise and that West Side Story was produced outside of the Hollywood system. I'm not saying it's not a piece of Hollywood, it's a perfect piece of Hollywood, but it was produced outside of the system. Give us a little background on on that. Uh, we know about the studio system and how actors would be signed to multi-year contracts and they would have to work for a studio, et cetera, et cetera. What eventually led to this breaking of actors uh, becoming independent entities unto themselves? I can remember Burt uh, Lancaster formed his own production company yeah. and several others. How did that start? How did they, they start breaking that? Mm-hmm. Well, the, 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 the short story is uh, an important lawsuit in um, monopoly, like an antitrust, anti-monopoly see, of it. lawsuits that started happening, you know, in the late 40s, early 50s, though it took a long time for things to actually uh, happen because in the, in the very classical era, from about 1930 to 1960, the movie studios owned the means of production, distribution, exhibition. They owned the art department, they owned the music department, and they owned the actors, and they owned the producers and directors, right? Every, and everybody was just assigned from one product to from one project to the other, do this, do that. And they and they owned the theaters too. That that many. And they own, yes, the, the that's why you know many downtown had had a, a Paramount theater and a Fox theater and a Metro theater because and a, and a Lowe's which would have been the early Paramount because they all belonged to it was really the, the term we use historically is vertically integrated from top to bottom so that starts to break down a little bit with the the birth of the independent producers and some of it goes back to the 1930s to be frank right uh, David O. Selznick, for example, you know, he had his own production company, and then he made deals for uh, for distribution. Alfred Hitchcock, in uh, the early '40s, established his own production company, and then he would make deals with the studios. But these were big names, right? Hitchcock could write his own check uh, if he wanted to. Um, starting, you know, with with Rebecca, his first American movie, uh, which was a huge hit, right? Uh, but but it took a long time for that erosion to take hold. And then eventually a series of lawsuits involving uh, antitrust matters uh, that ended up breaking down, literally breaking, breaking up the studios. And that allows, right, Bert, uh, Kirk, uh, well, Kirk Douglas in the 1950s, he had his own production company, right, right. Bryna Productions. He produced Passive Glory and Spartacus as an independent producer and Lonely Are the Brave as an independent producer, right? Uh, Burt Lancaster had his own independent, but these are huge stars, right? These right, people had, the power, yeah. They had the clout. They could call friends and say, hey, I'm going to go have my own production company. Would you like to invest? Uh, you know, and Burt Lancaster produced movies for himself and he produced movies for others, right? Most famously, Marty. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. The 1955 Best Picture winner uh, produced by Burt Lancaster's independent production company small little movie no stars no flash no color huge hit and a movie loved by gener- you know through generations right uh, so obviously the, the 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 studio formula was eroding and when the moment came it just all 
fell apart, right? And then later, not so much later, but then later in the 70s, the old big studios started to be bought by, uh, by multinational you know, conglomerates uh, that for whom making movies was actually oftentimes a write-off, right? It's happening to Paramount in the 70s and happened to uh, you know, Columbia in the 80s and et cetera. So. We'd like to remind everybody that anybody that has any questions for Dr. Munoz, please put them in the chat. Yes, I was just going to say, um, we have a couple questions, um, which we'll get to in a couple minutes. Um, so thank you, Bobby, for that. We, we'll get to them in a couple minutes. Um, but first, I want to um, get to, um, to another issue um, that you touch on in the book, because, um, well, the first thing, you know, the, the music and the lyrics, right? Just the, the, the music and the lyrics of the, of the, of the movie and the play. Um, America is really important because that is something that a lot of people focus on. But before we get to America, I just want to you, maybe and again, Bobby, this is something you can talk about as well. I, I mentioned there's been a lot on online already. I mean, the movie hasn't even come out and there's already like stuff online about it. And there was an article that came out um, yesterday, the Women's Media Center. Um, and this woman, this, um, the, the writer talked about um, the non Puerto Rican composers were in, inaccurately using mariachi rhythms from Mexico, flamenco from Spain, and mambo from Cuba. While musicians sometimes fuse various musical genres to the brand of salsa that is distinctly Puerto Rican, you might want to talk about that, Bobby. Um, yeah. the, comp the composers don't blur these lines deliberately. They created an essentialist mashup that is fundamentally flawed in its assumptions. And then she also says, never in the film do we hear Puerto Rican music like plena. So, what, first of all, who was the person that wrote that? Give them credit, you know. Um, Dr. Grisela Costa. And um, she what? wrote this article, Filmmakers Against Latin Access to Play Dress Up Again. Well, real quickly, from a musical standpoint, she doesn't know what she's talking about. And, uh, you know, uh, first of all, salsa is Cuban music played by Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico and in New York with a, New, New, York, York. With a New York Rican attitude. Uh, second of all, the reason there's mariachi, well, there's not mariachi music, it's wapango from, you know, it's not mariachi music, it's wapango from Mexico because that music was well known by Puerto Ricanos who attended Mexican made movies because Mexican cinema was huge in the 1950s. Not Maestro Leonard Bernstein knew that. Yep. I remember seeing all these Antonio Aguiar and all these great actors from Mexico and the great comedian Cantiflas when I was a kid as my mother took me and my sister Joanne my father Jose took us to see these movies at the Teatro Puerto Rico, the Teatro San Juan in New York City, other uh, and other places. So Mexican music was part of the New York Puerto Rican experience, and I'm sure it was part of the Puerto Rican experience on the island as well. So as far as mambo is concerned, that was the music that Puerto Ricanos grew up listening to and heard and danced to in New York City. It was not only big with Puerto Ricans, it was big with Jews. Italians, African Americans. It was the music that brought everybody together at the Palladium Ballroom, where Master Bernstein attended with his wife Felicia Montealegre. They used to go there, mm -hmm. dancing, etc. And Cuba and Puerto Rico have always had this incredible relationship. Uh, I can tell you personally that radio was not as developed in the 1930s and 40s in Puerto Rico as it later became, and the music that most Puerto Ricans heard in those years was from Cuba and you are what you eat. So people heard Cuban song, some Montuno, danzones, et cetera, et cetera. Mambo, guaguancó, guarachas, et cetera. That was part of the Puerto Rican experience. And the music became part of our ethos. Plena, Plena had been recorded since the twenties with uh, Canario who first adapted it to dance band performance, but it was not part of the mainstream of listening by Puerto Ricanos. It was still a music that was uh, heard in the in the countryside, etc., in places like Ponce, which was a center of plena activity. Bomba, uh, some people have told me, hey, how come Bernstein didn't use Bomba? Bomba had just been adapted in the mid 50s or started to be adapted by Rafael Cortijo to dance band performance. It was still mar a marginalized music on the island. So uh, those are, from the musical standpoint, there is some Puerto Rican aspect in West Side Story. When you go to the song America, it is a controversia 
which like is something that. that happens in the mountainside of Puerto Rico, to cantores, cantadores, or whatever, however you want to call them, two vocalists go against each other, and they do it in decima controversia style. They have a musical controversy. It's One an argument. Their opinion, the other person gives the other. Right. Controversy is between who? Anita and Bernardo. So right. Bernstein was very adept at doing, very deft and very masterful in what he did. In terms of the flamenco aspect, I don't know what she's talking about flamenco. The only thing I can think of she's thinking of is when the female uh, uh, shark, shark debs or debutantes, as they would be called in those days, the girlfriends of the sharks, they raise their forearms in defiance of the uh, jets at the, in the mambo dance. And I thought that was masterful in terms of the choreography because it, it ties us to the supposed Madre Patria Spain, where we get our language. And second of all, it's like a big F you to yeah. suggest that we are proud and we are noble people. So yeah, anyway, and, that's what I have to say about that. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I, I'm currently working with the musicologist, uh, Elizabeth Wells, who is editing the, the Cambridge Companion to, to West Side Story. And, uh, you know, she's written a lot, very much about what, what Bobby's saying in terms of what the soundtrack of the Latino neighborhoods in New York would have been like. That is, it, it was the soundtrack of their lives. It was in the radios, it was in the car stereos, whichever few cars had stereos. You get all this, you know, my brother Carlos, who's sitting here with me, is reminding me, you know, we had people like Daniel Santos and, and the trios. The trios were Mexican and Puerto Rican. Sometimes they were Mexican and Puerto Rican. Uh, so that, and they would have been, you know, part of that, of that musical landscape. Uh, as well, besides um, Bernstein, Sonheim, Robbins, Lawrence, they didn't set up to write a, a Puerto Rican musical. They set up to write this musical, which happens to have a certain, you know, musical logic uh, that is that it has no particular need to be faithful to to anything. Um, but it is faithful, as as my friend and colleague Bobby here is explaining to what the, the what I'd like to think of the soundscape of New York would have been. And, and musicologists, uh, as well as music, musician, musicologists like Bobby, uh, they, they've talked about this. And, and, and we know, uh, furthermore, being faithful is not the function of a movie or, or a theater show. I mean, I'm sorry. It's, uh, the the and and there is there's no there's I mean in this day and age there's no such thing that is strictly Puerto Rican or strictly New York or strictly New York you know it's uh it's it's all a single universe I mean in many ways. What's interesting to me is that through what what Bernstein masterfully did is show the cosmopolitanness yeah. of the New York Puerto Rican experience because we had when I remember when I was a kid we had these albums of Mexican artists at our, in our home because we listen to that music as well as listening to Cuban uh, big band Mambo as interpreted by who? Machito, Tito Puente, and Tito Rodriguez, or the big three, the biggest, the three biggest orchestras in the history of Latin music, two of them led by Puerto Ricanos. So although Tito, Rodriguez, uh, Tito Puente is New Yorican and Tito Rodriguez was half Puerto Rican and half Cuban. His mother was from Holguin in, in Cuba. Right. Yeah, so. So, but, um, so Ernesto, maybe we can, um, you guys, you guys talked a little bit about this controversia, um, this argument that, that yeah, America I, brings up. And America seems to be the center of controversy. And you have a whole chapter basically like dedicated to that. A whole chapter on it. Yeah. And, and you know what? At first, I remember one time in a conversation, maybe with the Brooklyn one, I was like, wow, everyone always just, whenever I hear someone complain about it, they always bring up the women's arguments, which are the, consumer pro-America arguments. I was like, yeah, but if you listen to the Bernardo and the guys, like they're really putting down the United States. Why don't people like put that out? And I'm one, and you know, and, I'm, and as I was getting ready for tonight, I was reading some other articles that people have written about, and they do point out that, you know, America portrays America, United States, the oppression and the promise, right? It, it is ambivalent. What, why do you think, what do you think is your take on why that, it, it, that, that song remains so, so, 
controversial. And also, is it maybe because some people have pointed out they're, they're upset that Rita Moreno is the only Puerto Rican in the cast and she sings it. I mean, does that have anything to do with it? Or, what, I mean, is it the lyrics? What do you think is sort of makes that so pivotal? I think um, the, the thing that I always respond in terms of, of, of or pushing a certain kind of response is context, context, context. Rita Moreno is the only Puerto Rican in the principal cast because she was the only person of her stature who would have had the opportunity of being in this movie. She had name recognition. She had been in movies for 10 years. Uh, and uh, she took the best part that had been offered to her in her entire career. Why wouldn't she? As, a, as an actor, a working actor looking to, uh, to continue to grow. Uh, as an artist, there's no question. I mean, I mentioned in one of our, um, uh, I think it was when when Virginia, our colleague Virginia Sanchez Corral was uh, interviewing me for her uh, Brooklyn College, uh, for her Brooklyn College uh, audience. Uh, you know, Jennifer Lopez played Italian American. I, I wasn't angry about it. I thought that was perfectly fine. And she was great, uh, you know, in a movie called Out of Sight. Uh, right, Dennis Farina plays her father. Um, you know that I didn't have a problem with that. Uh, actors do what is required of them. Now we want more parts to come about, but if they don't, then they have to do what they have to do uh, as as performers. Right. Uh, in terms of the America thing, I think that those who yes, what what. What the original stage version of West Side Story did was clearly uninformed. Uh, it wasn't ill, um, you know. Ill, it, it wasn't ill planned, but uh, but it, it came out kind of wrong, right? Um, the Rosalia, the original America, right? The producers of the movie, and again, <clears throat> the screenwriter uh, Ernest Lehman, he said. This this song is ridiculous. This these lyrics don't make any sense. Why would these people we be singing these words about themselves? It don't make any sense. No, well, let's work it out. Let's turn it into something else. And then it takes that political edge, where in fact, the what stays with me with the uh, the new the new America lyrics, the revised America lyrics, is the boys part, not the girls. That's what stays with me. That's my Bernardo was right, uh, which, and of course, the fact that Anita has that that turn uh, in the third act is, is like really important. She realizes um, all we've been told is a lie. And Bernardo is right. Mm -hmm. Terrible time in America. Um, everywhere grime in America. Um, so that's, and that's, that is the takeaway trying to hold on to, right? I think I, that was a section in, in my book that I, I, I use the term, must we burn West Side Story? Well, only if you're not paying attention. If you're not paying attention, yeah. But if you're paying attention, if you're paying attention to the lyrics, to the experience, to what happens, um, to the art in Anita's uh, persona as a character, right? The, the most basic definition of narrative it's a change that occurs over time. And I um, I would wager in any number of situations the West Side Story more than anything else is the story of the awakening of Anita. It's uh, not only, I mean, she is by far the most interesting character. We know that. I mean, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, but, and ultimately it is in many ways, it's all about Anita. And Bernardo was right. If I walked by the street and one of you was lying down bleeding, I'd spit on you. You know, that's the other thing too, you know, thinking more about this movie, you know, lately, because, you know, be starting with Bobby, you know, working on this and, and reading your book and all this is that, um, yeah, you don't, again, our knee jerk reaction is like, it's a gang movie. It's about these guys. It's about gang, but actually the women are so much, um, yeah. Their characters are so much more important. Their characters are so much deeperly, deeper defined and, 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 and are important yeah. to the story. And I don't think a lot of times we don't, we miss that again about all the other things. You know, we, we kind of, a lot of it, we all tend to miss that. Um, one of the things too that I read in some of the articles, people were like, well, 
how can they just show Puerto Rican singing and dancing when, um, or, you know, or, or deal with these issues, you know, deal with the gang issue in the, in, on, you know, in New York, when there's, you know, the sterilization programs going on at home, there's economic problems, you know, people had to come over on steamships and cargo planes because of all these issues. They never bring that up in West Side Story. But then it just made me think, you mentioned that movie Poppy earlier. Did anyone ever yeah. put that onus on Poppy? Like, why did it ha- a guy feel like he had to change from a Puerto Rican to a Cuban, which is a really heavy thing. It, it's better to be recognized as a Cuban than a Puerto Rican. Does anyone ever go to that movie and be like, whoa, Alan Arkin, you should be canceled because you made a movie that, um, I mean, like no one puts the onus on Poppy to, to show all the, the, the history of colonialism, but West Side Story has to show the history of colonialism. I mean, wh- wh- why, again, is that just because it's so popular? It's, it's, the, it's so out they there, I guess. It's because they haven't seen Poppy, probably. You right. Know? Well, <laughs> yeah, the... Poppy's a lovely movie, but it, yeah. it didn't get anywhere as near as many eyeballs as, uh, as West Side Story would. And coincidentally, uh, you know, Rita has spoken often about the fact that after West Side Story, she didn't get a decent part in seven years. And that decent part was Poppy, because I think the movie was like 68 or 69. Uh, but uh, no, you're completely right, uh, Elena. But some of this has to do with the fact that West Side Story strikes a nerve in in a way that passive movies don't, Right. Um, and the fact that it was, you know, it is popular. And then there is also mm, the, the the question of, of identity of, of Puerto Ricans being, I mean, I'm still to this day, uh, I may get somebody, you know, upon learning that I'm, that I'm Puerto Rican, clap their hands and say, oh, happy to win America. I mean, <laughs> it still happens. So yes. Yeah. West Side Story is also a chip on our shoulders, <laughs> mm-hmm. but uh, but it but if it weren't if it weren't difficult if it weren't controversial I wouldn't be interested in it. You know I'm not interested in Twilight. Nobody's interested. In, you know it's not interesting. There's there's, there's no conflict. Uh, I mean and no and no real sense of the the fact that West Side Story riles people up and rattles cages. Uh, is because it is interesting and because it is controversial. And I, I, th- I think it's still powerful, right? I mean, I, I, I mean, I'm saying this. Right. And I, maybe I shouldn't say. Maybe I shouldn't say this because, you know, to call out things. But like, you know, the other big movie of for Latinos, 2021 brings us West Side, the new West Side Story, brings us In the Heights, right? So these two right. movies that are about Latinos are out there. And In the Heights, you know, is a story. It's a feel good story, right? It's families. They're working, working class families. They make it. They they're kind of they they make they they get their business. You know, it's, it's feel good. Personally, that's not my cup of tea. I mean, but it's really nice, I guess, to have a film that shows family and nice things. So that's why people, we want more to show, we want more things like that to show our culture, right? That there's yeah. people who are working and, and raising families and doing good things. But West Side Story makes you cry when you see it. I mean, it's like, it's so powerful. And I mean, to me that it's, a, and, and so I just wonder, like, you know, I, I would rather see West Side Story than, than In the Heights. And, and I'm, saying, I'm not saying, I'm not trying to put down In the Heights, it's good for what it is, but yeah. It's it's just it's a little it's a little lighter, um, you know, and I just I, mean, I guess it's more like an editorial oh, thing on my point, yeah. You're right, and 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 in the Heights uh, failed to find uh, a large audience in part because of the uh, of the Warner Brothers uh, distribution pattern that that put movies on stream and uh, in movie theaters on the same day, and I will I will see a movie in the movie theaters no matter what, right? But a lot of people are not like that. And, you know, it was still June. People were maybe a little more nervous about about the pandemic. Uh, But In the Heights served a really important role this year. And I I went to see it several times. I took all my girlfriends to see it. I invited, I told all my friends to go see it. But it was because we needed, we needed a feel good movie after the previous 18 months. We really did. In many ways, In the Heights did for me this summer, precisely because it's fluff, in beautifully made fluff, but it's fluff nonetheless. Um, but the In the Heights did for me in the summer of 2021, what La La Land did for me in December, in the, in the fall of 2016, 
after the 2016 election, I was literally heartbroken and I needed that beautiful fluff to uplift me. I mean, that is the social function of the Hollywood musical, of the classical musical. Is comfort to, food. In other words, comfort food, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And we need it, Bobby. We need it. You know how we need it. It's, well, like, it's to, to, to give us the, the illusion that everything is going to be fine. And La La Land did that beautifully in 2016. And La La Land is fluff. Again, beautiful fluff. And it's got Emma Stone, but it's fluff. <laughs> Uh, I meant the La La Land to us in the jazz, no, us no, in, the jazz no, in the jazz community in New York. No, I that's know, another, I, but that's another story. <laughs> I, lo I love to see, I love to see Ryan, uh, Ryan Gosling, as I call it, white splaining jazz. Uh, <laughs> not just mansplaining, white splaining jazz to, to the world. It's like no, but I, that's that's irrelevant. But the, yeah, the point is, we needed. I needed that big fat cotton candy. Uh, mm -hmm in the fall of 2016, as much as I needed in the Heights in the summer of 2021. Uh, West Side Story is a much more mature um, property and uh, it will as, you know, because of the sophisticated theatrical roots, uh, Bobby better than me knows how complicated the music score is. We, we think we understand it, but it's really, it's, it's, it's speaking a musical language that is Mm, you know, foreign and yet at the same time incredibly catchy uh, to most to most of us. But West Side Story will. My prediction is that will initially it will it will attract uh, a, a mass audience of Steven Spielberg fans and uh, and general you know um, young people who want to go to the movies. And then eventually it's going to settle into more connoisseur kind of uh, select audiences and and uh, I'm I'm sure I'm sure that'll happen. I, I don't think that in the heights is a fair um, comparison. Uh, also because in some ways in the heights is much more of course Broadway audiences are what 99% white. Uh, you know in the heights was a hit. It wasn't the Latinos who made in the heights a hit on Broadway. I mean I, I hate to put it that way. <laughs> And if they were counting um, of, if they were counting on the Latino community to make in the Heights a crossover hit, it was, they were, they were looking at the wrong markets. Uh, West, the, the market for West Side Story is much, it's going to be much bigger. It's like, I don't know, my brother is pointing out, if, uh, in the Heights is more like E.T. and West Side Story is more like Closing, like closing Counters of the Third yeah. Time. <laughs> well, actually, there's a couple of comments in the Facebook, people just making comments. And I think what's important about In the Heights, remember, too, is that, and th there's another comment about Blackboard Jungle, the sort of, which we'll get to, I want to get to the gang question in, in a moment. Yeah. Um, you know, the gang thing, and, and In the Heights, it's sort of a remedy to that, because we did have, like, you know, representation is important. You know, I mean, even though I always, I always say, like, oh, my dad was in a gang, I, I get that story, so I don't mind the gang thing, but... It, in the 50s and 60s when the only way you're represented is by that that's problematic and i think in the heights is sort of showing there's this other side to us there's other different there's other latino groups they're not just puerto rican or mexican there's other groups there's and you know and, and people do people are do a lot of other things than than, than are in gangs so i think that's an important part of this sort of development i guess um of finally in hollywood what, what how it's representing us but before we go on to that whole issue with the gangs um there's two questions they're very similar, so I'm going to ask them together. Anna Matthews asks, why does this story persist? And why do you think audiences are still interested in it today, which you've talked a little bit about? But then Frank Torres asks, does West Side Story persist primarily because of its music or because of the storyline? You know, um, I think it's a little bit of a little bit of both. I mean, on one hand, um, you have a, a, a generally <clears throat> generally soaring score uh, that can be catchy. I mean, there are few products. Um, again, my, my colleague and friend Bobby Sanaria knows this better than me, but uh, there are, I measure uh, a, a musical show or a musical movie by the, the humming quality of the score. When I walk out of the movie, am I humming the score 
or do I completely forget what the songs sounded like, you know? And West Side Story is not like that. In that sense, it's kind of a, you know, Mary Poppins thing where, where every song is hummable. Uh, I, where, where there are so many musical highlights, right? And, uh, and, and West Side Story is like that. Um, and a score that is, as, as I, I mentioned uh, before, oddly complex and yet accessible at the same time. Right. And I don't know the magic of that, right? You're, you're the music and culture people. Uh, on the other hand, we are really looking at, let's not forget the, the Shakespearean uh, roots of West Side Story. This is one of the oldest stories ever told. And uh, however you, you dress it, um, you know, hands, lips, how many, how many times uh, have, some iteration of uh, Romeo and Juliet being um, produced as a movie, as, as theater. So there is a universal, really a universal quality to, uh, to this story that you can dress it up in a number of different ways. And we've seen what, how, what you can, as many versions as you can imagine, right? West Side Story happens to have staying power uh, also. Um, I think aided by by uh, by this score that really flies us into the air and uh, allows us to to touch so many different uh, emotional high points um, and why you know the revivals on Broadway most recently the the Ivo van Hove uh, in uh, 2020 uh, which I didn't see because I had tickets to see it in May and then you know the world went to hell. <laughs> and uh, and I stayed with my tickets in my hand, uh, never saw the show. But of course, I meant to see it. Yet another reinvention uh, of of a story we think we know. Uh, but that familiarity is uh, is is really uh, really an important part of that staying power. So you know, nobody's going to remake. All due respect, nobody's going to remake in the Heights. Uh, nobody's going to remake Rent, which, by the way, I thought the movie was junk, but that's, you know, um, nobody, nobody's going to remake Evan, uh, Dear Evan Hansen, you know, this, I mean, the new, by all accounts, the movie was a piece of junk, too, right? Um, West Side Story lives in its own, uh, in its own level in, in many ways, and it's a high mark uh, in the history of the of the Broadway uh, musical and now in the history of the Hollywood musical, no <laughs> doubt. You know, we've, we've seen the movie. I, I know we're not, we're only allowed to say so much about it, but um, I think many people are going to be very pleased. Yeah, I think that, you know, one of the things, well, like you said it uh, best, basically it boils down to Shakespeare was uh, a mother flower. You know, <laughs> he came up with an incredible story that, as you said, what person viewing tonight or all over the world right falling in love with somebody that a fam but that family members say you shouldn't be going out with that person because they're from another culture they're from right. another race or it's not going to work out this that and the other it's it's just an amazing universal right. story and it's a transcendental one in and what? a show, a show of this, Bobby is, and and I know Elena's ready to get in <laughs> question. Now, this we can say we have all seen how much uh, the the balcony scene, as we call it, you know, it's a in in West Side Story, it's a fire escape, right? Window fire escape scene. But we have all seen how much that has featured in the publicity and marketing materials of this movie, as it does in the 1961 movie, right? That is iconic. That is an image, whether it's Natalie Wood and Richard Beamer, or whether it's Shakespearean actors, or whether it's now, you know, uh, Rachel Ziegler and, and Ansel Engord, that is an image that speaks for itself. It is iconic, it is endemic in a way. And then you hear two notes of tonight, tonight, and we're all in tears. <laughs> Aren't we? We're all in tears and lining up with our good earned bucks to watch this stupid movie. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just, I hate movies. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, but speaking all that, you guys are talking about how it's universal. Yes. And, and then it does, you know, the, the Romeo and Juliet story 
is um has been done many times because it is it is it is and this idea that like bobby you always talk about i think you know they the the, the people who made west side story this idea of overcoming hate and i think that's i think that's a very important sure. uh, part of, of the story but yet all the stuff we've talked about today all the aesthetics that you, know, you talk about all the great aesthetics of it all these you know the great acting the great dancing the great music all the stuff together be, do you think because I want to get the, my last question is really about the whole gang issue and also anyone any more questions please um, put them in the in the Facebook comment section so we can ask um, Dr. Acevedo Munoz um, all this we've talked about all this great stuff still if you are Puerto Rican and feel like this came out at a really bad time when the you know the whole this whole Cape Man story with Sal Agron was that his name um, Negron, Agron. Sal Agron, yeah. Um, Right. You know, that came out, Puerto Ricans were migrating in huge numbers. There were all these other movies, like someone pointed out Blackboard Jungle. You know, we're in this sort of time when there's a panic about, you know, young Latinos causing all this trouble. That's always going to be the issue. So no matter how you dress it up, it, you're not going to like it, right? You can't like it. If that's your issue with it, no way, nothing you do there's to no it, way. like yeah. it, right? I mean, right. so... Wait, I, I call it Hispanic causing panic. <laughs> yeah. So I guess so. That's always going to lose that. We're always going to lose that. Um, right. Paul, Paul Simon made a, a, a musical about the the caveman, and it was it was a bomb. It was one of the worst things Broadway has ever seen. Nobody yeah. wanted to see it. But that they said, you know, I mean, even though they had really good musicians taking part in it and stuff, I mean, they just it didn't have the same you know, the great the same musical, I guess, yeah. level that that West Side Story or the did. Name recognition, yeah. And and also, I guess it's unfortunate that I think someone pointed out, maybe Francis Negron in a, in one of her articles, that you know you go to fifty years later, the only Broadway show you decide to do is another gang movie, but a uh, gang themed one. But um, the other thing with um, the gangs, though, too. So you know, yes, it it was bad timing. You could say like were Bernstein and Sondheim and all those guys, they were cashing in on on this sort of panic <clears throat> at that time, but. Um, Recently, Spielberg, Steven Spielberg was in an article, someone quoted him <coughs> as saying that West Side Story is also important because of what's happening at the border now. And someone said, um, mm. someone said, well, you're saying you're comparing it to the border. You don't know what you're talking about because Mexicans have a completely different origin story than, you know, uh, history and then Puerto Ricans and migration, immigration experience, of mm. course, which is true. But on the other hand, I thought the one thing maybe to think about is that yeah, Puerto Ricans aren't really thought about as gang members as much. I mean, that's not really. We have other issues we have to deal with, a lot of other issues, but gangs is really not the P Puerto Rican issue. But, you know, Donald Trump used the MS-13 scare of Central Americans in gangs to scare people a few years ago. I mean, is that so maybe the gang issue is still an issue for Latinos, right? Like it's still a point that we have to contextualize and be careful about. Very much so, because the, the, the generalization um feeds on like trump and ms-13 <laughs> feeds on the um acknowledgement that most people is technically uh -oh, don't know the difference hello she's still there she's still there okay like the most people don't know the difference you were really really still too bobby so i didn't know if we were <laughs> suddenly you're like <laughs> Uh, so the it's all these prejudices are so much invested on the knowledge that for a lot of people we're all the same or Latinos are the same or brown people are the same. There's no distinction about the specifics of the Puerto Rican experience or the border experience. Uh, you know, as I I make a point in in the books that the in the book that Puerto Ricans are not immigrants, not in the uh, in in the sense of the word that uh, that that comes to mind when people use the term uh, immigrant or use the term to remorn to to refer to brown people at the border, right? Our border is you know my our border is the Newark Airport. That's our border. We, we just fly to Newark uh, and uh, other people fly to O'Hare, right? That's that's our border um, or JFK or LaGuardia. It's, um, but it is the, and gang violence, of course, is now um, something that would come to mind in terms of the Central American, Central American gangs, 
right? They're operating in, in El Salvador and, and Guatemala. It's not even, I mean, yes, it's also a Mexican problem, but it's not really a Puerto Rican problem, not in, not in that sense. I mean, when's the last time that the, the Latin kings had even a Puerto Rican leader? I mean, I don't even know if they exist but <laughs> anymore, but, uh, you know, but the fact that for many people, there is no difference, right? We're all, like the, the Spanish use the term uh, sudaca to refer to everyone south of the border, right? There's no distinction whether Bolivian or Peruvian or Colombian or Venezuelan or Panamanian or, uh, or from the Caribbean or not, right? And so that, and that ignorance, I mean, unfortunately, that ignorance is not gonna go away. Uh, that is, uh, it, it's a reality of, um, you know, a great, oh, it's a reality that is part of the experience of this country, being ignorant. Uh, <laughs> and that's not, being ignorant and having guns, and that's not going to change. It's not going to change. And being brown is being brown, whether, uh, you know, whatever your, your your background is, like like the, the guy in Mean Girls, the the Pakistani boy who's dancing with the girl and says, are you Puerto Rican? And she says, I'm, um, I'm, oh my God, what is it? Um, I'm Syrian or something like that. And he says, oh, I, I, I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things someone asked in the, um, in the comment section, Luis Fuentes, who was, we just saw in New York recently, um, he, under, he said, I understand the West Side Story captured the experience of Puerto Ricans in New York in the 1950s. And that you know that's important. But what do you make of the critique that um, that you know people say that people don't like the movie because it how it, the stereotypes of Puerto Ricans and of Puerto Rico and that Puerto Ricans are in a, viewed in a largely negative light. I mean, how do you see that? Or you know, you're talking. You know, yeah. How do you see it? How do you see that? Uh, once again, I think that judging we want to judge movies not for what they are but for what we want them to be. Every time I read a movie review about how this movie didn't do that or didn't do that, or why didn't this movie go there, I, I am bored to tears uh, because we want to criticize the movie for what it isn't instead of for what it is. And West Side Story is a parable. West Side Story is deeply rooted in its Shakespearean tragedy um, place. And yes, it has characters, it has Puerto Rican characters and they do what they do. And in the end, as, as you know, Elena, I, I argue strongly that, uh, you know, the sharks win. The sharks come out as the, as the good guys, the, you know, Anita's, the, the awakening of Anita is the, the the principal narrative arc of the movie of the of, of the entire property of West Side Story. Um, that is the movie I saw. That is the movie I saw when I was a kid. That is the show I've seen on in theaters many times. That is the movie I saw on August 19th in Sac Harbor with uh, my uh, my group of friends from uh, from the West Side Story board. Uh, and that is the movie I'm going to see on December 7th at El Capitan Theater in Hollywood. You know? <laughs> That's, um, and it's not the movie that it isn't, it's the movie that it is. Um, and and did, does, would anybody say, take a bullet for West Side Story and say, and not agree that there are lots of problems? I don't know anyone who would. I wouldn't. Uh, I don't think Rita Moreno would. Uh, you know, but it is... Um, so th there is no way that everyone is, and if, is going to be happy. And if everyone were, then I'd probably be really bored with this movie. If, if everybody came out happy, hey, like in the Heights, you know, <laughs> if we'll come out singing salsa. And yet I didn't remember a single tune anyway. But that's interesting you say that too, because I think Bobby brought this, I think you, you brought it up in the book and I know Bobby talked about it when he wrote about it too, is that, and I never, I never thought about it before too. It was like the only ones, except for Tony, all the, the Puerto Ricans have jobs in the film. You know, yeah. they, they have jobs, you know, they speak better. Yeah, um, I wrote this up, but, yeah. But it, it, but it's just like, it's the thing, it's just, it's the gang thing. Just can't, like we, like we do, a lot of us, a lot of people just can't get past the gang. It's like, it's said, it's made right. to a gang. And so I think I'm, that, 
that setting. But it's not. It's not. If people use that 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 argument. It's not. It's not really a gang movie. No, it's, it's a. Not. It's it's a. It's a. It's the most incredible love story that that has been. It's probably the the greatest love story that has ever yeah. been and uh, as, realized. As, you know, as as Elena have said, you know, um, right. My she said several times. My dad was in a gang. My dad was a, well. Mm, there is there is a social logic to to gang uh, to gangs, right? Whether you know w w we think of gang mm, as synonymous with uh, crime and and uh, extortion and and street fights and and rape and whatnot, uh, but the reality is that there is there is a a, a social logic to gangs that is not necessarily. Um, married to to criminal content and what I, I point out in in my book is that there's evidence in the movie that this neighborhood is changing this neighborhood is is evolving into uh what looks like it'll be eventually a hispanic neighborhood right it's it's evolving in a certain direction uh what bernardo and the jets are and the sharks are doing is what gangs were invented to do to begin with, protecting themselves and protecting their their turf, right? Uh, whatever indistinct that, that turf is, right? And that's, uh, there is a logic to that. It's not about being vicious. We don't see the sharks like robbing people or uh, we see them defend uh, their turf. Uh, and Bernardo explains, um, the Jets started it. You know, sure, the Tonight lyrics say, and they began it, but they began it, but it's it's established at the at the war, at the war council, uh, the war council uh, sequence that takes place in, in Doc's candy store in the in the movie, uh, that the 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 Jets started it. They who jumped me the first day I moved into this neighborhood. Uh, you know, the 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 Jets did. Well, who asked you to move in? And Bernardo says, who asked you <laughs> to move into this thing? Right? And that's where, and then things escalate, right? To the, 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 the racial tensions. But these are territorial more than, than racial uh, to begin with. I point also as a, as, a, as a visual irony in the movie that the War Council sequence takes place with a, with a, a picture of the uh, the Definitely. famous picture of the Declaration of Independence, right? That's right. Uh, in the background, right, and then the the the, the ironic singing of the lyrics uh, of of the other America song, right? My country, tears of the uh, yeah. whistle it, yeah, they whistle. Yeah, it. it's 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 that's that's political content that puts the sharks in in a certainly a non passive place, right, and. What are they going to do? Well, they 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 stick together. And yes, the girls work. Uh, Maria and Tony, Maria and uh, Bernardo's parents work. Uh, they they own the local bodega. They are in in this transitioning neighborhood. Um, that's really what what it's about. It's about change that is inevitable in the demographic and cultural context of 1950s New York and the the few people who think that they can stop that that change right that they that they can still be um, in charge of whatever it is they're in charge of right some crummy streets as as Lieutenant Schrank calls it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's funny to me is like uh, I never hear anybody who's uh, for lack of a better term from the white side saying Hey, how come you the white people in the movie they they're portrayed as like evil right, as gang members? I mean, well, but it's always about... it's always people from uh, uh, from mostly that I hear the criticism from people from the island saying, "Ah, oh, porque están enseñando lo que somos miembros de ganga? Why are they showing us that we're members of gangs?" I say to them, "Do you know what it is to grow up in New York City?" Yeah, but but Bobby, the, 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 you know that could also just be the fact that you know white people don't have to worry about one depiction of being in a gang because they have thousands of depictions of of politicians and and you know and and you know teachers and educators and, and everything else, but um, to represent them. But just um, 
there's a couple comments. So people made some comments. Um, a couple people, Frank Torres, a couple people made comments about the Kate man in, in this comment section. I must say, you know, we were talking about that it didn't do as well, but I do, I did go see it. And I remember the opening, it opened up with a huge Puerto Rican flag, like a huge Puerto Rican, it was a full curtain. And I remember hearing a lot of people were really moved by that, this idea that like, you know, at the time of all this gang violence in the city, Puerto Rican flags weren't allowed, you know, I mean, that was some, you know, on the island and stuff, that was a really, you know, you couldn't show your flag and you couldn't, you know, show your patriotism like that. And to have, to be on Broadway and to see this like huge flag open curtain was really moving and powerful. <clears throat> And, and then someone mentioned, yeah, he mentioned that they also won two, two Tony Awards. Um, yeah. And then someone mentioned about, you know, the, the Young Lords gangs, like, you know, Felipe Luciano, someone's saying this. So Felipe Luciano points out that the gangs of the, you know, Young Lords were created to protect Puerto Ricans. And I guess, you know, as, as Ernesto was saying, you know, gangs do come from socioeconomic reasons why, why communities have to, why young men form gangs in a way. So it is, it is some, it does say something about society, unfortunately. But... I want to say, um, you know, I want to close out, and I want to thank um, Dr. Acevedo Munoz so much for taking mm-hmm. time on um, on, hol- on Thanksgiving Eve to to sit with us and to talk about um, the movie. And um, someone I just before, I just want to end with um, people are saying in the chat that the movie's relevant, and someone's asking Luis Fuentes is asking the real question is who is it relevant for? And then maybe to just close out too, Pedro Taino says. You know, now that we see, you know, In the Heights came out this year, West Side Story is coming out. You know, he, he makes the point, we need to start supporting our own, right? We need to make movies about ourselves and support the film, you know, um, you know, if Hollywood doesn't do that for us. So, I mean, can you talk, maybe can you talk about what do you see as sort of like the next step in <laughs> I, I development? Say, I want to say one thing, uh, actually, just one little thing in terms of, of, of the gang thing. Uh, let's not forget... Uh, going back to the to the to the times of the of the of the Five Points neighborhood, uh, and that New York was the modern city of New York in the 19th century was invented around gang culture. Puerto Ricans didn't invite didn't invent it, and and certainly Tony and Bernardo and Riff didn't invent it. So that that is part of New York history, as as you say to uh, as well. Uh, I'm gonna I'm I I would. Gonna, if I had to say something in terms of what what this movie can do or what we can see, um, there is the 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 the, free, the, lang, the lingua franca of Hollywood is money. Uh, if this movie proves to be a crossover uh, a crossover commercial success, and I'm, and I'm I'm really glad that it's happened. Few people other than Steven Spielberg could make it happen because he's a very powerful figure in Hollywood and he wanted to do this and he wanted to do it right. Now it's up to uh, the public, to people, for people to show up. We have another interesting contextual uh, test happening right now. That is the movie Encanto, uh, which is opening uh, today. Mm -hmm. Uh, After you recall, you know, Coco was a big hit. Uh, a few years ago, so we can't we can't just judge by In the Heights, which did fairly well, and the reviews were great, and I thought it was a lovely movie. Um, West Side Story has the capacity of crossing over, uh, and uh, if that happens, I mean, there is it's inevitable that more and more and more doors are going to open. It just uh, what will be critical is um, who's knocking on those doors. And uh, who's going to open those doors for uh, the the Latino community, the Hispanic community? We have so many stories to tell, um, and if the markets respond, then Hollywood will respond. I mean, we've seen this with African American cinema in the last you know decade or so. <clears throat> Suddenly, it turns out movies featuring black characters and black situations are making money. Now we have a bunch of them. Many of them very good. So we have, this is an opportunity. And again, I say um, to everyone who came before and tried to do it, but um, the the name of, of Steven Spielberg has a lot of weight. Uh, and so on one hand, you know, uh, if, if the movie does as well as, as we would expect, um, it is only the beginning. Let's Let's put it that way. Well said. Well said. Well said. Bobby, do you have any any closing comments you want to say? 
I think that uh, the movie will resonate. I, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that it will resonate with young people. And it, I'm hoping that it will resonate in particular with Puerto Rican young people, especially oh. in New York City, who are so detached from their cultural heritage and the importance that Puerto Ricans have in making this city a cauldron of rhythm with our poetry, our art, our theater, our fighting for bilingual education, our fighting for patients' rights in hospitals, all of those things, our music, uh, our dance, uh, our food, everything. And I hope it awakens and resonates with people across the country to the importance of this small island that's only 100, about 100 miles long, 35 miles wide, that has given so, so much to this city, transformed this city, and supposedly we're the greatest city, not only in the nation, but in the world. And if we were, if Puerto Ricans were so important in transforming it in the modern age into this cauldron of vibrancy and uh, rhythm, then that means that we, as Puerto Ricanos, count for something that's even greater than each one of us as individuals, we right. as people. So I hope that, that that's what happens right. with this movie, with this film. Thank you, thank you, people. You've been very kind to to invite me and and let me share this uh, this great this great moment. Oh, it's been really great. Thank you. And we just want to end with saying, if you like the idea of um, West Side Story, if you're still any everyone out there and anticipating the new West Side Story movie on December eighth, we're going to have another online program um bobby's going to do um a breakdown of the song g officer crumpy from his west side story reimagined with um the whole percussion section of his band so you'll get to see um how they incorporated um all these different afro latino rhythms into that so um that'll be december 8th and on december 21st we have our annual paranda puerto rican style paranda which we do in the melrose neighborhood live where, again we did it on video last year but this year will be live going from community garden to community garden in the casitas in the melrose neighborhood on december 21st so um check our facebook page for that for the information on that and then we also want to thank jorge Vasquez for always doing all our technical work and making sure everything runs properly. Thank you, Jorge. And to everyone, have a great um, long weekend. Be safe and enjoy. And Thank Elena, you. if you could hold up Dr. Munoz's book, because I think oh. everybody should get it. Mm -hmm. West Side Story as Cinema. This book is essential reading. I don't know if it's backwards on the Zoom, but... Um, no, no, it's uh, oh, does it come through? Okay, and on the Zoom. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> this book is essential reading for any lovers of film, any lovers of good reading and of course any lovers of West Side Story. Thank so. you. Thank you. You're very kind. Okay, well have a great night. Good night. Bye bye everybody. Que viva Puerto Rico, coño. Amen. Ernesto, if you're still there.